This year, I'll spend less time with God. I will hide my faith from my coworkers. This year, I will spend more and tithe less. I will read the Bible as little as possible. I will remain silent. When I know I should speak. This year. This year. This year, I will not share my faith with my best friend. I will shirk leadership responsibilities every chance I get. I will continue to justify my bad behavior. And give God my leftovers. This year. This year. This year, I will let the busyness of life squeeze God out. Maybe it was me. <laughs> you know, when it comes to um, the types of resolutions that people make, that Americans, not surprisingly, focus on self-oriented changes. Among those planning to make resolutions, notice this, the top pledges over the years relate to weight, diet, and health which is 30%, money, debt, and finances, 15%, personal improvement, 13%, addiction, 12%, job and career, 5%, spiritual and church-related, 5%, and educational, 4%. So notice where the, in, in this gamma of, of different things, spiritual and Church-related or 5%. Now, again, everything, a lot of times it's just a personal thing, self-improvement. So personal improvement responses, this is what most of them included, being a better person. How many of you maybe said, I need to be a better person this year? Giving more. Having more personal leisure time. Organizing their life or home. And having a better life in general. This is, you know, from personal things. Now, while people concentrate on themselves when making priorities in the new year, it is telling, friends, that so few Americans say that they want to improve their relationship with other people. Because, again, a lot of it is just personal. How do I improve myself? There are virtually no mention of volunteer or serving others. Only a handful of comments about marriage or parenting. Almost no responses focusing on being a better friend. And only a fraction of people mention improving their connection with God. I want to say that again. Only a small fraction of people, when they, when they talk about the resolutions they're making, only a fraction mention improving their connection with God. Now David Kinneman, I've, I've, I've quoted him before, he's the president of the Barna Group. He explained these findings. Notice what he said. Only nine out of more than a thousand survey respondents, so notice not even, not even a percent, only nine out of a thousand mentioned that one of their objectives in the next year was getting closer to God in some way. Even in the rare uh, instance when people mention spiritual goals, it is often about uh, uh, activity undertaking for God rather than having a personal pursuit of God or experiencing themselves, God, experiencing God. You know, at, at times, it is hard to believe that we are in the year 2023. It's hard to believe that. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't know if you ever thought you'd get here. Especially those of us who have been around the block a little bit, right? Amen. 2023. I mean, I, I, I've mentioned that, you know, when I was younger, I, I, I never dreamed that we would reach the year 2000 because the, uh, thinking about the year 2000 had that futuristic flavor, right? Like we would be in the Jetsons somehow, right? But here we are, friends. And think about the last 23 years. Again, those of you who can't, because I know that some of you are, are young, but those of you who can't, from the year 2000 to now, our world has completely been transformed. Society has been completely transformed, and, and unfortunately not for the better, but for the worse. What we're seeing these days, friends, is crazy. A new study from the Pew Research Center shows 
Now, there, must, there may be a reason for this, the, everything going downhill. So this study from the Pew Research Center shows that American, uh, America's Christian majority has been shrinking for years. And in recent trends continue, they say that Christians can make up less than half of the U.S. population within a few decades. There must be a reason for that. How about in our church? If you think about the, how this you know, happens in what's, what's happening in the Adventist church. Well, according to a 2021 article in AdventistToday.org, somewhere between 40 and 50 people leave the Adventist church for every 100 that join it. 40 to 50 people, and the rate, will, and the rate has increased in recent years. Friends, Jesus is coming soon. Amen. He is coming soon. Amen. We are Seventh-day Adventists. I mean, you might expect uh, us as Adventists to believe that Jesus is coming soon. But friends, if there was ever a doubt in your mind, there should be no doubt. Amen. Look at what has happened, uh, how, how the world has changed just in the last two or three years. Jesus is coming soon, and yet many people are not walking with him or are even considering walking away from him. Now, others understand the importance of Jesus in their lives, but it seems that, 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 that their relationship with him has gotten a bit cold. I wonder if that's how you feel this morning. How is it with you, friends? What resolution, if any, have you made for 2023? I hope that, it, that, that that resolution, as opposed to the majority of what Americans do, I hope that that resolution is to strengthen your connection with Jesus. If you, have a, if you don't have a connection, to connect with him, and if you are connected with him, to strengthen that connection. Let's pray. Father, we pray for your spirit this morning. We pray that you, or through your word, will speak to us. So that indeed we will have a close walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Near the end of his ministry, Jesus addressed his disciples. John 14, I've, I've mentioned John 14 several times. He, he, he meets with his disciples and he tells them it's time for him to leave. His, his, his ministry was about over. His mission was about over. And he tells his disciples that, that he wants them to experience peace. He wants to leave them with peace, and he leaves them the Holy Spirit. John 14, 27, he says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives to you do I give. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Well, oh, friends, how, uh, how, how great it is that you don't have to be afraid in a world that is in turmoil and a world that everything is going downhill quickly, you still can experience peace. But then Jesus seems to uh, uh, shift gears in John chapter 15 because in, in John 15 he addresses how people can become his disciples. How people can become what? Do you want to be a disciple of Jesus this morning? How people can become his disciples. What we'll see today, friends, is that disciples keep their connection with Jesus. Disciples do what? Jesus. Disciples keep their connection with Jesus. So open your Bibles to John 15. The Gospel of John chapter 15 will start in verse 1. John 15 and verse 1. This should be a, a, a well-known passage for you. Very familiar, John 15 and verse 1. Jesus says, I am, I am what? The true vine. I am the true vine, and my father is what? Depending on your vine dresser, right? I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Now, Jesus is very intentional when he speaks. And as he's addressing the disciples, of course, and a Jewish audience, a Jewish audience would understand this, this illustration that Jesus is making when he says, the vine. I am the true vine. Because you see, in the Bible, Israel was likened to a vine. It was a, it was a comparison, an illustration that God always made. You are the vine. For example, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 21 Yet I have planted you a noble vine, a seed of highest quality. 
How then have you turned uh, before me into the degenerate vine of an uh, a degenerate plant of an alien vine? So, so here, you know, God made him a, a, a beautiful vine, a productive vine, a noble vine. But they turned their backs on God and became an alien vine. But here, the point is, you're, they're still a vine. But they became a degenerate vine, and now Jesus says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. The nation of Israel proved unfaithful, so now Jesus presents himself as the true vine, as the perfect fulfillment, as not, not fake news, friends. He is the, the real thing. He's not a counterfeit. Amen. So he is the true vine, and then he says, my father, God the father, is the one who takes care of the vines. He is the vine dresser. He continues in verse 2, some branches, is that what it says there? Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Now, what is the purpose of the vine? I mean, why, why does any farmer or gardener plant anything? It is to give fruit, right? The purpose of the, uh, for the existence of the vine is to produce something, to produce fruit, to give fruit. Now, now, now what we'll see here in John 15 is that these branches are a symbol of something. What are the branches a symbol of? The branches are someone. The, the branches are you. Jesus is the vine. He says, I'm the true vine. And what we'll see is that, is that the branches symbolize disciples. The branches represent those who have chosen to have a connection with the vine. So notice, friends, that, 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 that you cannot separate the vine from the branches. You cannot separate the vine from the branches. As the branches are dependent on their connection to the vine in order to be productive, Christians, friends, you and I, are dependent on our union with Jesus. If we are to be productive, if we're, if we're going to have a strong spiritual life, if we're going to have fruitfulness, we depend upon our connection with Jesus. Why? Because disciples do what? They keep their connection with Jesus. So again, here, the branches are the disciples. Now, there, there have been some disagreement uh, over whether this, these disciples that these branches represent are sincere, true disciples or they're fake disciples. Now, you know, as, you, as I've told you many times, I, I have conversations with other Christians about different topics and, and, um, and, and what, um, you know, you, there, there are some who believe once they will be saved, you know, once you accept Jesus, you really don't have any responsibility. And, and so, of course, John 15, it, it flies in the face of that. And so the, their argument is, well, you know, the, 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 the disciples that Jesus is addressing them, they're fake. They're not sincere. But I want you to notice the fact that, that Jesus says, every, every branch in me, in me, this, this in, the word in is a preposition here, often try, let, translate it with. So, so these branches have a connection with the vine. They are in me. They are with me. Further, more, if, when you go to chat, uh, verse 3, and we'll, and, we'll, and we'll touch on verse 3 later on as well. But it says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So, so they are in Jesus. They, they are already clean. So clearly they're a sincere uh, disciples. They are sincere branches, if you will. They have a connection with Jesus. And they've decided to connect with the vine. But notice, there are times when the branch doesn't fulfill its purpose. There are times when the branch doesn't fulfill its purpose. Again, the branch, the disciple in this case, is supposed to do what? You're connected to the vine, you're going to give fruit. But there are times when the branch doesn't fulfill its purpose. There are times when the disciple does not give fruit. And friends, he who professes to be in Christ, this is important. He who professes to be in Christ is expected to give fruit. Amen. If you're connected with Jesus, if you've made a commitment to him, if you say, I'm a disciple, I am connected to the Savior, this is not an option. 
You are expected to produce fruits that are proportional to or appropriate for your profession. But what happens when the branches don't give fruit? Well, it says it there in verse 2. Every branch that does not bear fruit, what happens? He, because, because he's, he said the, the Father is the vine dresser, the one who takes care of the vines. So it, it, the, the branch that does not give fruit, he, the Father, takes away, according to verse 2, right? It says it right there. But now what does that mean? What does it mean when it says that, that, that God, the Father, takes them away? Now, some versions of the Bible, you may have uh, one of those that says that the Father cuts off the branch, right? So it cuts off the branch that does not give fruit, okay? And that would make sense in, in, in when you think about the, the, the sense of Jesus is using this illustration of the vine in a branch. If the branch isn't doing anything, why keep it around? This is just occupying space, so just get rid of it. But you say, right, but I, I want you to think about this, because I, as, I, as I study this passage, this, I, I'll be honest with you, it bothered me a little bit. Branch does not give fruit, so God cuts it off, gets rid of it. But is that the kind of God we serve? Does God give up on us that easily? See, that's why it bothered me, because the God that I know, does, he, he continues to pursue me. He, he doesn't give up on me. And so I, I, as I, I looked at this a little further, and, and it's, I found that this is interesting. Um, this, uh, this term, takes away, in, in, the, in the Greek word, in the Greek tra- uh, uh, word it, that it's used for takes away, is also translated in other versions or other parts of the Bible as lift up. The same words, the same word that is translated as takes away in other parts of the Bible is lift up. Huh? So so does the Father give up on them? It it would seem to me, no, that the Father, these branches, these disciples, those those that have claimed the connection with Jesus, but, 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 but they don't give fruit. God does not give up on them, but he lifts them up. He he provides a positive ministry of encouragement. He he provides an environment for them so so that they're able to produce fruit. God does not give up. So notice here then, the dichotomy here. uh, uh, um, You have the branches that don't give fruit, and then you have the branches that do give fruit. Now, the, 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 the expectation would be that, all right, well, if, if the branch does not give fruit, it is useless. Let's get rid of it because it occupies space. Now we have the branches that do give fruit. Well, they're obviously doing what they're supposed to do. So, so in our minds, it would seem, well, maybe, maybe what God should do is to encourage, continue encouraging the branches that are giving fruit because they're actually uh, doing the right thing, but the branches that don't give fruit are, are wasting space and time. Let's get rid of them. But, but God does something opposite. He, he lifts up the ones that don't give fruit because he wants to encourage them to produce fruit. But what does he do with the ones that do give fruit? According to verse 2, every branch that bears fruit, what does he do? He prunes. Any of you ever pruned a plant? Anybody? Some of you are familiar with pruning plants, right? Is pruning a... a a good thing? Is that a, a, a positive thing? Well, you, you, could, you could argue that the outcome is pruning, but the process of pruning, is this a, a, a good thing? Uh, let me define pruning for you, because it, pruning is defined as to cut off. To cut off or cut back parts for a better shape or more fruitful growth. So a, a pruning is a way of cleansing. But is pruning something pleasing? If you are the plant, if you are the plant, right, and God is pruning you and he's cutting off some stuff, is that that pleasing? No, it isn't. So think about this. If the branches are the disciples, these are those that, 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 that have claimed, that, that have professed a connection with the vine, with Jesus, 
and, and, and because of that connection, they are producing fruit. Here, God now, it's, now i got to work on you. So it doesn't make sense. Because in our minds, well, you know, the branch is giving fruit. They're doing the right thing. The ones that don't give fruit, well, they're the ones that are a problem. But God is encouraging. God's lifting them up. But the, the ones that are giving fruit, oh, i, I got to work on you. And pruning is not a, a good or pleasing thing. And so why? Why is it that, 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 that God prunes the branches that, that are giving fruit? And, and how is this pruning accomplished? We've said already that pruning is not a pleasant thing. Why does he do this? In the book Sons and Daughters of God, page 289, L. White writes that the followers of Christ may be doing some work for the master and yet not be doing half what they might do. Not that I want you to think about that a little bit. Your follower of Christ, the followers of Christ may be, may, may be doing some work, but not half of what they could be doing. So notice, a, 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 a disciple, the branch, is connected to the, the, the vine. You're a follower of God, or a follower of Christ, you're a disciple, and, 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 but you, you could be doing something more. You could be producing more fruit. So, because they're not doing half of what they could be doing, she says, he then prunes them. He does what? He prunes them. He's cutting them. Eric, he's working on you. You get the little scissors. and. But why does he prune them? Listen, this is deep here. He prunes them. Why? Well, because worldliness, self-indulgence, and pride are cropping out in their lives. There's a connection there. You're a disciple, right? You've, you've claimed that connection to the vine. You're a follower of Christ. You, you, you're doing some work, you, but, but, but you're not producing what you're supposed to. Why are you producing what, what, what it is expected of you? Even though you're producing something, but you're not producing everything, is because, she says, worldliness, self-indulgence, and pride are cropping out in your lives. So here comes a, a, a husbandman, the, the, the vine dresser, the one who takes care of the vines, and, and she says a husbandman clips off. Notice, here it is. The scissors, he clips off the surplus of the tendrils of the vine, thus making it more fruitful. Notice it doesn't say making it fruitful, because that would imply you're not giving fruit. But God deals with the ones that are not giving fruit in a certain way. I don't know what he's doing. He's encouraging. He places them in, in some kind of environment so that they can start producing. But if you are already producing, he wants you to produce more. You're not producing more, so he cuts off those areas that are not working. The worldliness, the self-indulgence, so, so they can produce more. She says these hindrings, causes must be removed. And the defective outgrowth cut off, cut away, to give more room for the healing beams of the sons of righteousness. Now, if, you, uh, if you're anything like me, when the new year starts, I like to review the previous year to see what God has done in the previous year. The blessings received in the previous year, but not all the time are blessings. There are times when we, when we review the past year, we, or we say, well, man, I'm glad that a new year starts. I'm glad to, hear that leave uh, that, to leave that year behind because it, it caused me so much trouble. Friends, some of you are... I have dealt with some really tough things this past year. Yeah, I know, I know some of you that, that, that are in this church that have dealt with cancer this past year. And, and, and because of, of the disease, and, and maybe that has less to, uh, le uh, led to financial distress. Some of you have lost your jobs. Some of you have lost relationship with friends. Friends, you know, sometimes God allows certain things to happen in our life that we can't understand. Just yesterday, I conducted a funeral. 
Those of you in prayer meeting know we've been praying for a friend of mine that used to be a member of my church that I baptized that she has cancer, just like some of you that in this church, she has cancer, she's, you know, a serious form of cancer, had surgery now, has to go through treatment. And if that wasn't bad enough, on New Year's Eve, her son is instantly killed in a car accident. 25 years old. Why, God? Going through all these things, again, I said to you, pruning is not a pleasant thing. It's not a pleasant thing. And, and you argue, well, shouldn't Jesus take care of his disciples? I mean, this, this kind of thing shouldn't happen to us. But again, notice that she says, and, and this might not be necessarily true in every circumstance, but certainly there is something here. It, it, the pruning takes place because worldliness, self-indulgence, and pride are cropping out in their lives. The character must be cleansed. The character must be pruned. And that happens by tests and trials of life. And this, of course, is not pleasant. It's not pleasant. The good thing, though, is that, is that the father is the one who oversees the process. And we already know the Father. We know that the vine dresser cares for us. And so someone over here said, yeah, well, the, the, there's going to be a good outcome with the pruning because that's what God wants. He oversees the process, but it isn't a pleasant thing. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, Paul says that no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. So the pruning, painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Notice. Notice what God the Father, the vine dresser, he is doing. He's training you. And, and, and this is not pleasant. It's painful sometimes. It's like Henry uh, boot camp, SEAL team training. Painful. But in the end, it has positive results. So God oversees the process, this cleansing, this pruning, and, and he does this by the trials of life. And also, also notice verse 3 again. You're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So, so this process of, uh, of pruning, of cleansing, also takes, word, uh, takes a, a place by the word, a power of the word of God. But I want you to notice, friends, that in this process of discipleship, God has a part to play. And I would argue that God does the heavy lifting in the process of your discipleship, of making you a disciple. He does the heavy lifting through his word and through these trials of life, the pruning. Because he wants to make sure that you produce the fruits consisting of someone who is walking with him. He does the heavy lifting. So, well, friends, don't blame God. Don't get, blame God or get mad at him for using the tools that he knows will be necessary in order to make you better, in order to make you more fruitful, in order to make you a disciple, because disciples keep their connection with Jesus. Yeah, and that's our responsibility, by the way. God does the heavy lifting. It is through this process of, of pruning the trials of life, through the power of his word, that, that, he dis, that he cleanses you, that he prunes you. But then our responsibility is to what? To keep our connection with Jesus. And this is what he says in verse 4, which was our scripture reading. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So God uses these trials. He, he, he uses the kinds to prune you so you can produce more fruit. But friends, understand that you cannot produce fruit by yourself. You cannot produce fruit all by yourself. For you to be produce the fruits consistent with a person who is the disciple of Jesus, you have to keep your connection with him. And this is key, friends, to this passage, to, to our responsibility. Jesus says, abide in me. What does abide mean? We don't, kinda, we don't use that kind of word in our, angle, in our language these days. But this word comes from the Greek meno, which means to stay or to remain. Hmm? Stay or remain in me. 
So, so the implication is that, that, that there is a connection. You've made that decision, but now he's asking you to what? To stay. Now, this word abide is a verb. And in the Greek, is in what's called the aorist active imperative tense. Which means, basically, that, that the action being described is something that happened in the past and gives rise to an action that Jesus has commanded you to do in the present. In other words, you have decided to accept Jesus. You decided to connect with him, to, to walk with him, to be a disciple, but doing so in the past isn't enough. Isn't enough. Jesus commands you to keep doing it. To do it now. Yeah, you did it in the past, and you remember how great it was, how great you felt when you decided to connect with Jesus. Yes, friends, but, but, but you can't just say, well, I did it in the past, and that was enough. Yeah, I accepted Jesus when I was six years old. Yeah, I haven't been to church since, but that's okay because I connected with him back then. No, 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 it can't just stay in the past. Our decision to walk with Jesus and be his disciple is not relegated to the past. It must be a decision that we carry out in the present, right now. Because disciples keep their connection with Jesus. And so could it be that in spite of God's work of pruning, the work of a husbandman, a vine dresser, despite the pruning, you know, the trials that, that he's allowing you to, to go through to cleanse you, those things that are not pleasant, could it be that you're still not producing fruits in your life consistent with a disciple? Only you can answer that question. Yeah. And so if that's the case, could it be that you're not abiding in Jesus? Again, only you can answer that question, but it's, it's important to you do a self-evaluation. If there's no fruitage or if, or if there's not enough fruitage, could it be that you're not staying with him, remaining with him, keeping that connection? How sweet it was in the past, friends. But something is keeping you busy. Something is sidetracking you to the point that your connection with Jesus is weak at best. We cannot produce fruit unless we abide, and that is our responsibility. That's what Jesus says there in verse 4. Again, abide in me. That means remain, stay connected. I in you, and as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it stays, unless it remains connected. Neither can you unless you stay, unless you remain connected to me. That's our reality, friends. And you've heard me say this before, but how do we abide in Jesus? How do we stay connected with him? And it seems all the more appropriate to talk about it as we start our new year. We stay connected with Jesus. We abide in him. We remain by actively spending time with him in the study of his word, in prayer, in a prayer life. And, and again, when I say the study of his word, it's not just reading a passage here and there, but, but, but an active thing every day, eating of the bread of life. A prayer, prayer at time, it's not just the, you know, the 10 seconds you say a prayer when, before you eat a meal, but, but an active thing completely every day, spending time in conversation with God. We spend, we, we spend time with Jesus, we abide in him, we remain by, by telling others about the love of Jesus, about the gospel, by witnessing. We remain, we stay connected with Jesus by being actively involved in the church. Not just sitting there listening to the sermon and going home, but by actively being involved in the church. That's how you stay connected with him. That's how you remain. That's how you abide. That's how you abide. Book Steps, Steps to Christ, page 62. Christ changes the heart. Notice it's not you that changed your heart. Christ changes the heart. He abides in your heart by faith. So by faith, he, he, he stays connected to you. He doesn't let go, by the way. But notice she says, you are to maintain this connection. So again, Christ changes the heart. He abides in you by faith, but you have to maintain that connection. Maintain that connection with Christ by faith and the continual surrender to the will uh, of your will to him. And as long as you do this, he will work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. 
as long as you do this, as long as you take the step to stay connected, to remain in him, to abide in him. He will do it. Jesus is clear. Verse 5. I am the vine. There it is again. You are the branches. So there you go. This, this concept that the branches are the disciples is not something we invented. He says it right here. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me, again, if he who remains, he who stays connected in me and I in him bears, bears what? No, it's not just bears fruit. It bears, he bears much fruit. See, that's the key there. Because remember, the branches are connected and they're, bear, they're bearing some fruit but not bearing a lot of fruit. God wants you to bear much fruit. And so if we abide in him, if we stay connected to him, we will be fruitful. We will bear much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. So this is important to God. This is important to Jesus. But someone would say, well, you know, what's the big deal? At least I'm giving some fruit. But Jesus continues in verse 6. Now this, this is uh, deep in verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, what happens to the branch that doesn't abide in Jesus? He's cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Now, as you read that, you may be thinking, well, Pastor, that seems a bit of a contradiction to what you said earlier. Remember I said, the branches that don't give fruit, and God takes away, but, you know, we looked at that word in Greek, and he lifts up. He encourages them so that, so that they give more fruit. But there at verse 6, it seems to imply that he gets rid of them. But, but, but we have to, you know, go deeply into the passage because sometimes we, it, we miss him. Notice that Jesus doesn't say, if anyone does not give fruits or if anyone does not give much fruits, he is thrown away. He says, if anyone does not abide. See, the key issue here is abiding, is staying connected, is remaining. That's the issue. That's the key issue here, friends. Because if you don't stay connected to the vine, what's going to happen? You're going to die. It's, it's common sense. It's a logical thing. It's a natural thing to do. If you don't connect it to the vine, you're going to die. And if you die, you certainly can't produce fruit because you're dead. You're talking about spiritual death here. And so if life, friends, is keeping you distracted, is keeping you busy, weakening your connection with Jesus, or maybe disconnecting you all, 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 all together with him, what's going to happen eventually? You certainly won't be a disciple because you are going to be spiritually dead. And that is the key here, friends. Stay connected to the power. Remain connected to the power. There's a story of um, Pastor Herbert Jackson. He was a missionary and a missionary professor in seminary. He gave, gave a class on missions, and he tells his experience when he was a new missionary. Some of you may have heard this story before. Um, as a new missionary, he was assigned a car that would you know, help him you know, do his missionary work or back and forth to do the things he needed to do. But the pro there was a problem with the car that you needed to push it in order for it to get started. Some of you have had cars like that. Some of you may, have, may still have cars like that. <laughs> and so he devised a plan to deal with this, this problem. And so he went to the school nearby and, and he got permission to take some of the children out of class when he needed to start the car so that they could push his car and he can get it started. And, and, and as he made his rounds, he, he would either do that with the children or he would park it in the hill so that, you know, it would go down, or he would just, just basically leave it running. That was his plan. And he did that for two years. Great plan he had. He was proud of his plan. But then he got sick, and so he was forced to leave the missionary field. And so before he left, the new missionary came, and he's training the new missionary and telling him what to do. And, and he proudly explains to the new missionary his ingenious idea about how to get this car started. And so as he's explaining it to, the, to this a uh, uh, new missionary. The new missionary is busy looking under the hood. And before uh, Dr. Jackson uh, finishes his explanation, he says, well, Dr. Jackson, uh, I think your problem's right here. There's a little cable here. And so he just basically 
twisted the cable and went back side in the car and put the key in and vroom, started right off. Yeah. The power was there all the time, only there was a loose connection. A loose connection that kept it from starting. So, friends, how is your connection today? Does your life have joy? Is your heart truly filled with joy? I am the true vine. You are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you are looking for happiness, for true joy that does not depend on circumstances, you need to look to Jesus because he wants to give you his joy. And not only does he want to give you joy, but God, the creator of the universe, Jesus, who resurrected from the dead, wants your joy to be complete. Abide in him and he will abide in you. And from our true vine, you will bear fruit in abundance. So how is your connection, friends? I mean, if it's, if it's strong, it's certainly where it should be. And that will manifest itself in the fruitage in your life. But maybe you, you do a self-evaluation and you feel, well, I guess I have a loose connection after all. Or maybe your connection is non-existent. The issue is abiding, friends. And I wonder how many of you want to be a branch that gives a lot of fruit. Let me see your hands. How many of you want to be a disciple of Jesus? That, that 2023 will turn out to be the year that you are walking with Jesus. You are a true disciple of Christ. Let me see your hands. Maybe not everybody wants to be a disciple, but those of you who want to be a disciple of Jesus. Notice verse 8. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. Notice, not just fruit, but mu it is much fruit that glorifies God. So you will be my disciples. That's the, that, that is our end goal, friends. That is our desire. We want to be disciples, but you can't be a disciple unless you bear much fruit. And you can't bear much fruit until, until you abide in Jesus, stay connected with him. That's the secret, friends. A disciple produces much fruit because a disciple keeps their connection with Jesus. And so I, I wonder, I want to challenge you here um, this morning or this afternoon already. I want to challenge you, friends. Because maybe you have already made a resolution. You've established goals for your life this year. But when you analyze them, as we looked at the opening story, you think, well, you know, they've been kind of self. I've been just focusing on myself. And I haven't really desired to have a closer connection with Jesus. But maybe you've decided, you know what? I do need to make that connection. I do need to be, have a strong connection. I want to abide. I want to remain in him. I want to stay connected. And so as we, as we sing our closing song, I'll go where you want me to go. Notice, that's the point, going wherever God wants us to go, doing whatever God wants us to do. If your desire today is, you know what, I really want somebody to pray for me so that I can have that strong connection with Jesus. As we sing that song, if that's your desire today, to make a resolution to be a disciple, to make a resolution to, to work on your connection with Christ so that it is strong and you bear much fruit, and you want someone to pray for you, you just come to the front.